All right. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining me for this study for those that are worshiping today. So today we are going to look at a study that is not part of any of the series of Songs of Songs, but we're going to talk about a study entitled God of Our Salvation. It's an impromptu study uh, since I'm not available for the Songs of Songs study. I think we'll do that later on, maybe next week. Or during the week. So we're going to go to the book of Psalms as we talk about God of our salvation. So we'll look at a psalm in the book of Psalms and the study is trying to show us the salvation that God has actually procured for us and what it has taken for God to give us salvation. We'll talk about those as we go into the study. So we'll look at the book of Psalms chapter 85 Psalm chapter 85, we'll look at verse 1 through to 13. That's going to be the focus of our study for today. So Psalm chapter 85, I'll give a background, a little bit of a background of the chapter itself. Uh, the chapter historically is a passage that speaks of how God delivered ancient Israel. Now, there's been a lot of debate whether they were actually in captivity, the time when this psalm was being written, whether it was being written by David or any of the, because we thought it's the psalm of the sons of Korah, as we go through the study. But whether if they were in captivity, but it's going to talk about God delivering his people, how God delivers his people from Babylon. And it speaks to us ultimately to how God delivers us as his people. You see as we go into the study. So how God delivers us from, delivered his spiritual Israel, because we are called Israel on the premise of the only one who is Israel, and that's Jesus. I don't know what's wrong with the camera. It's trying to refocus, focus. I don't know. Let's see. So we, God, as God's people, we're called Israel on the premise of the one Israel, the one overcomer who is Christ, and how God delivers us from spiritual Babylon. So that's the background of the psalm that we're looking at today. So we're going to go to the book of Psalms, chapter 85, and we'll begin reading from verse 1. So it says, To the chief musician, the psalm of the son of Korah, it says, Lord, Thou hast been favorable unto thy land. Thou hast brought back the captivity of Jacob. So just from the psalm and the introduction itself from this one, it's telling us about something that the Lord has done. It says, Lord, thou hast been favorable unto thy land, and thou hast brought us back from the captivity of Jacob. Continuing, it says, Thou hast forgiven the iniquity of thy people. Thou hast covered all their sins. Selah. Pause. The three says, Thou hast taken away all the, thy wrath, and thou hast turned thyself from the fierceness of thine anger. Remember, it's talking about God's salvation and what God has done. Thou has delivered thy people. Thou has been favorable unto thy land. Thou has brought back the captivity of Jacob. Thou has forgiven the iniquity of thy people. Thou has covered all their sin. Selah. Thou has taken away all thy wrath and thou has turned thyself. You have turned yourself from the fierceness of your anger. Verse 4, it says, in Psalms 85, verse 4, it says, Turn us. So the first verses, the first three verses are talking about what God has done. But when you go to verse 4, it says, Turn us, O God of our salvation. And this is where the title is coming from. Turn us, O God of thy salvation, and cause thine anger towards us to cease. Will thou be angry with us forever? That's a question that he poses. Will thou draw out thine anger to all generation? Will thou not revive us again? In verse 6 of Psalm chapter 65, it says, Psalm chapter 85, sorry. Verse 6, it says, Will thou not revive us again? Will you not revive us again, O God? And grant us thy salvation. 
and grant us thy salvation. Verse 8, it says, I will hear what God, I'll hear what God the Lord will speak. For he will speak peace, shalom, peace unto thy people, rest upon his people, unto his sense, and let them not turn again into folly. Surely his salvation is nigh unto them that fear him, that glory may dwell in the land. Mercy and truth have, have met together, righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Truth shall spring out of the earth, and righteousness shall rain down from heaven. But verse 12 says, Yea, the Lord shall give that which is good, and our land shall yield her increase. And verse 13, which is the last verse of our focus in the study, it says, Righteousness shall go before him and shall set us in the way of his steps. So that is going to be the focus of our study. Psalms chapter 85, verse 1 to 13. So I've already set out the historical context of the psalm. But I want us to look at verse 1. Verse 1 says, and to the chief musician, this is a song. It says, to the chief musician, a psalm of the son of Korah. It says, Lord. So as we talk about God's salvation, he's been addressed here by the specific characteristic of him being Lord. This is the self-existence, all-sufficient Jehovah is being addressed in this case. It says, by thy name, by this name Jehovah, by this name Lord, he's addressing God. By this term Lord, this divine quality being invoked in this psalm, it says, Lord. This is the same name that God reveals himself unto Moses as he's about to deliver his people from bondage. So it seems like there is a certain quality which is being revealed every time God is about to deliver his people. And that's the quality of being Lord. That self-existence, Yahweh, the life giver, the life taker, the jealousy one, the one who is jealous over his people, over his bride. He is the one that is being invoked in this psalm. It says, Lord, the self-existence, all-sufficient Jehovah is being addressed. Jehovah is being addressed. And this is the name here which has been pleaded. The sweetest divine character of God is appealed to here. And this is the divine character of him being Lord. The sweetest divine character is being appealed to. It says, Lord, thou has been favorable unto thy land. It is God's favor unto the land. Him that is the all-sufficient God, the self-existent one, is the one that has been what? Favorable unto the land. And says, thou has brought back the captivity of Jacob. We'll talk about verse 1 through to 3. So it says, it says Lord, this is a past tense which is being used. Thou has done something. There is a work that has been done by God. And as we go through the study, you begin to see that this is how a child of God speaks. The child of God refers to what God has done. In the first three verses, this reality unfolds, you see, as we go through the study. Okay, just give me a minute. So in the, th in the first three verses of the chapter, this reality begins to unfold. Lord, thou hast done. It is a finished work that is being referred to in verse 1. Yahweh is the Lord himself that has achieved this work. Then he says that there's a word there, thou has been favorable. The word favorable in verse 1 is full of meaning. If you look at the meaning, the context in which it's used in the scripture, the word favorable means, it appears 22 times as accept, six times please, 
And then six times again, pleasant. Delight five times. Enjoy four times. Favorable three times. Acceptable one time. Accomplished one time. Affection, uh, aff affection one time. Approval one time. That's the word favorable. It says, Lord, thou has been favorable to thy land. It's referring to the favor of God himself. In the context of this, it means to be pleased with. God has been pleased with the land. It means to satisfy a debt, to accomplish, to set affection, approval, or consent. It is God that is doing that for his people. God has been pleased with. And as we go through as we consult himself to a certain group of people. Listen to what Genesis chapter, chapter uh, 33, verse 10 tells us. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 13, looking at this idea of God being favorable unto his people, God being uh, satisfied, a debt being paid. Look at what Genesis tells us in Genesis chapter 33, verse 10. It says, and Jacob says, nigh, I pray thee. This is Jacob. Remember, it says, you have turned the captivity of Jacob. So we'll talk about Jacob as well, because Jacob is essential to the study and the captivity that he was in. Uh, in the previous study, when we talked about the Songs of Songs series, we talked about the house of Laban where Jacob went and how he suffered there and the purification that he went through, coming down to the time when he was in, in Adam Palan, that land where he fought with God and wrestled with God. But look at what it says when Jacob encountered his brother in Genesis chapter 33, verse 10. It says, and Jacob say, nay, I pray thee, if now I have found grace in thy sight, that is being favorable, grace in your sight, then receive my present at thy hand, for therefore I have seen thy face, as though I have seen the face of God, and thou, and thou wast pleased with me. So that word being pleased with, it's the same word being used here, favorable. So it refers to a time when Jacob was meeting his brother to reconcile. And his brother said, well, you can keep your sheep, keep all these things, I don't want them and all that. And Jacob says, nay, if I have found grace in your sight, favor in your sight, and I've seen your face, your reconciling face as the face of God. As the face of God, and if you are pleased with me, do accept my present that I give unto you. In Leviticus chapter 1, verse 4, again, the same idea of God has been favorable unto the land. It says this, And he shall put his hand upon the head of the burnt offering, and it shall be accepted for him to make atonement for him. That word, accepted. The atonement act of being accepted is an act of God. It's an act of favor. God is accepting the atonement for, which has been made in Leviticus chapter 1, verse 4. So still going on, still looking at in verse 1, it says, Thou hast brought back the captivity of Jacob. Why? Because he was well pleasing. He has done this. God has done something for to bring back the activity of Jacob because Jacob was well pleasing in the sight of God. He is doing something that the people could not do for themselves, escaping from captivity, escaping from the wrath of Esau was something that Jacob could not do for himself. Escaping from Babylon, escaping from the Philistines, and all this, the people of God could not do it. Hence, God has to do something. He has to bring back the, cap the captivity of his people. Escaping from all this, they could, not, they could not do it. Hence, here, we find him doing it for us. So there's something that God is doing for his people that they cannot do for themselves. They cannot do for themselves. You say uh, it's, it is something that is free because there is nothing in us. It is something that he does in himself because there is nothing in us that can recommend us to be saved by God. There is no human quality in us that makes us savable or lovable. God saves us because 
He is salvation. God loves us because he is love. The unfolding principle of his kingdom, the basis of his kingdom is love. The minute there was the fall, the plan of salvation was not an afterthought that God now is being taken by surprise. Like we are taken by surprise by events. God is not taken by surprise. It's the unfolding principle of his kingdom to serve. Sovereign, it says... Is choosing, God is choosing to serve us based on his sovereign quality. And sovereign means it's based on him, it's not based on us. It's his sovereign right or quality to serve. It's not based on anything that man is in himself. And in Romans chapter 9, we're reminded of this. Romans chapter 9, verse 13, we're reminded of this. We're talking about the God of our salvation and we're adapting our study from the book of Psalms for those that are watching. In the book of Psalms, chapter 30, chapter 85, we're still looking at verse 1, breaking it down. In Romans chapter 5, listen, Romans chapter 9, verse 13, it says, As, as it is written, Jacob have I loved, and Esau have I had. That statement seems to be unfair. How can God hate Esau? But the better question is this, because people battle that question and say, how can God hate Esau? And how can he love Esau? How can he love uh, Jacob? The better right question to ask is this. How can the God who is sovereignty, in his sovereignty, in his love and omniscient, love a rotten sinner like Jacob? Jacob means deceiver, supplanter, crooked. How can God loves him and not love Esau, the one who had the right to inherit things, the one who robbed God of his glory? How can the supplanter be loved? How did he do this? Let's look at the Bible. Let's go to Psalms. We're still in the book of Psalms. Psalms chapter 85 verse 2. Listen to what it says. Listen to what God has done. It says, Thou hast forgiven the iniquity of thy people. Iniquity, the twistedness of thy people, the crookedness of thy people. Thou hast forgiven the iniquity of thy people, and thou hast covered all their sin. And then it says, sell our pose. And think about what you just read. God has forgiven the iniquity of thy people. How can God forgive and still be just? Because it tells us in the book of Romans that God died for the ungodly. How is God going to be just in this case? So forgiven to lift up in a great variety. There's an application. It says thou hast forgiven, that word forgiven, to accept, to advance, to carry away, to bear. To spare, God has done that. In Isaiah, the idea is, 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 is being communicated to us about how God has done this, how God has forgiven. What's the premise of his forgiveness? What's the promise of, uh, of forgiving the ungodly and to take away their iniquity of his own people? Listen to what he says in the book of Isaiah 53, verse 4. It says, surely he has borne our grief and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken and smitten of God and afflicted. So the premise of God forgiving is not like he winks at everything else that has happened, but he bears the consequences of the sins of his people. He bears them. And we know that Calvary is the ultimate picture of how God bears the iniquities of his people. So he came, he came to us. He came to us in our poverty, in our fallen state. God comes to us. We don't go to him. Listen to what he says in the book of Ezekiel chapter 16, verse, uh, read verse 4 through to 6. Listen to what he says. And has of thy nativity, God is beginning to define 
the nativity of his people, this bride composing his people. He says, as, you, as of your nativity, in, in the days that you were born, thy navel was not cut, neither was thy washed with water to supply thee, and you were not salted at all, or swindled, or swindled at all. You were not clothed at all. You were naked. He says, none eyes pity thee to do any of these things unto thee, to give compassion unto thee. No one pitied you. He says, but thou, had, thou was cast out in the open field to love to thyself. Thou was cast down, you were cast out to open field, you were cast out in an open field to the loving of thy person, the hating of thy person. And in the day that you were born, you were cast out already. Then it says in verse 6 of Ezekiel chapter 16, it says, it says, and when I pass by thee, when I, God says, I did this. When I passed by, thee, by you, I saw you polluted in your own blood. I said unto thee, when thou was, when you were in your own blood, Blood, this is what I say. This is what I declare. This is the divine, the divine declaration of God. God declaring something upon that which is lo loved, that which is wallowing in its own blood. God says this. Listen to what he says. I said unto thee in thy own blood, leave. Yea, I said unto thee in your own blood, leave. Leave. This is the declaration of God. God declares life. He speaks. We don't. We don't have any power. But he does. He says, I declare, leave. He came to us. He, he, he came to us in form of a baby to get to us. Jesus was born. He grew in a womb as a baby because he, we are sinners from the womb. So the work had to be done at its nanoparticle level, at its atomic level, at its uh, nucleus level. God had to be born in a womb because we are sinners from the womb. Look at him talking about himself. Look at these verses when he talks about himself, when he talks about how he came to go through the metrics of salvation, to rescue human beings. Look at what he says in the book of Psalms, Psalms chapter 139 verse 8. We're talking about God of salvation, how he works out salvation, how he achieves the work of salvation. Look at Psalms chapter 1, uh, Psalms chapter 139 verse 8. He says, if I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. It seems like David is talking, but basically this is the messianic, uh, the messianic chapter. It's talking about the Messiah who is coming. If I ascend up to heaven, thou art there. If I go, if I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. The depth of him reaching hell to die for us. God was present there. It says, if I take the wings of the morning and I dwell in the uttermost part of the sea, even there your hand doeth lead me and your right arm doeth behold me. Verse 11, it says, if I say surely that the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. This is God. It says, yea, the darkness hide not the hide." Hide not from thee. Darkness does not hide from God. But the night shineth as the day. The night is like a day to God. The darkness and the light are both alike unto thee. God sees the darkness, sees the light. They are all the same unto him. It says, for thou hast possessed my reins. This is God possessing Jesus in his reins. Listen to what it says. It says, thou hast covered me. In, the womb, in my mother's womb. God has offered salvation from the womb. It says, I will praise thee for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. We usually get that verse and paste it on us. 
fearfully and wonderfully made. But primarily, it's talking about the one who is fearfully and wonderfully made, and that's Jesus when he took upon human nature. Marvelous are thy work. The work that he does, marvelous. It says, it says my soul knoweth all well. My substance was not hid from thee. When I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lower parts of the earth. Curiously wrought, the curious work of God. The work of salvation. And in Psalms chapter 22, we're reminded of this. Psalms chapter 22, verse 9. It says, but thou art he that took me out of the womb. If you look at Psalms chapter 22, the whole chapter itself is in just in verse 1. You're going to discover that's Jesus on the cross crying and lamenting as he's doing his work, this work of salvation. Listen to what he says in Psalm chapter 22, verse 9. He says, but thou, is pleading to his father. He says, but thou, you are the one that took me out of the womb and you did make me hope. We're saved by hope. And you did make me hope when I was upon my mother's breast. And in Psalm 22, verse 10, it says, I was cast upon thee from the womb. This is the matrix, the level to which God went to achieve our salvation. That thing that was born when Mary was told that you're going to have a child, that holy thing was from the womb holy, different, separate from us. From the womb, it's holy. He says, I was cast upon thee from the womb, and thou art my God from my mother's belly. This is the matrix of the womb where God entered. We watched the movie Matrix and how the, the, the hero changes and enters into this, all this. But that is a picture of what God has done to rescue us. So here it says, um, going back to the book of Psalms, chapter 85, it says in verse 2, it says, Thou hast covered, thou hast forgiven thy iniquities of thy people, and you have covered all their sins. With his blood, with his righteousness, God has covered all our sins. Thou hast covered all thy sins, all of it, every spot, every wrinkle, the veil of love has covered all sin. Sin has been divinely put out of the divine sight by the act of Jesus. Hiding it beneath the propitiation of Jesus, the mediation of Jesus, mediating his blood, his righteousness. Covering it with the sea of his atonement. That's how huge his atonement is. It's like the Red Sea. The Red Sea where the children of Israel passed and then Pharaoh and everybody else was coming behind. They were all taken and covered. It's a picture of how God destroys the enemy called sin who pursues us by his atoning. It's the Red Sea, the act of the blood of Jesus, the Red Sea. It's been blotted out, made to seize and the Lord has put it completely away, even his atoning, even his omniscient, omniscient eyes, omniscient eyes, that they will see it no more. God says, I'll remember it no more. Because of the atoning act of Jesus, God says, I'm going to remember it no more. What a miracle this is to cover up the sun for God will be an easy work, but to cover up sin, <laughs> sin, the penalty of sin is divine penalty of sin. Though the wages of sin is what death, eternal death. And God has covered the eternal death penalty that we're supposed to receive. Not with the covering not without a covering atonement is sin removed, but by means of the great sacrifice that God has made on the cross of Calvary. That sacrifice which has been administered in the most holy place in his atoning work. That great sacrifice. The Lord Jesus Christ. It's the most efficient way of putting away an act forever. 
what a covering that his blood has afforded us. Now, that's what God has done for us to cover our sins. You remember it says love covers the multitudes of sin. Love does that. It covers. Just like in the book of, uh, in the book of uh, Genesis, God covers the nakedness of our first parents, covered them, covered them with a sacrifice. So if we go back to the book of Psalms, look at Psalms chapter 85, verse 3. It says, Thou hast taken away all thy wrath. He's taken away the iniquity. He's covered the sins. And then in verse 3, it tells us, Thou hast taken away all thy wrath, and thou hast turned thyself from the fierceness of your anger. How has he done this? How has God covered and taken away the fierceness of his anger? Let's see. Let's go to Psalms. We're still in the book of Psalms. Psalms 85 verse 10. It says, Mercy and truth are met together. And righteousness and peace have kissed each other. This can never be undone. And it can never be undone because the one act where mercy and truth met together, it's Calvary. Calvary is uh, an act of God that can never be repeated even by God himself. That one sacrifice, the center of our, the pillar of our salvation, can never be repeated. So let's go back to Psalms 85 now, verse 4. God has turned himself. But in verse 4, it tells us God needs to turn us. We don't turn ourselves. God needs to turn us. It says, turn us, O God, of our salvation. This is where the title is coming from. And cause thine anger towards us to cease. God needs to do a turning work in us. We don't do it. He does it for us. We need a turning. Why? Because in spite of the marvelous work that God has done for us, we love Babylonian mentality. We are trauma bonded with the devil. I've been attending a training and talking about trauma in counseling and all this. We are trauma bonded with the devil. So God needs to do a work, needs to turn us to make us see. So historically, Israel, if you look at Israel, the children of Israel, were not restored from captivity all at once. A few under Zerubbabel, some under Ezra, and some under Nehemiah, but a great number had remained in Babylon, in the Medes and the Persians in the Assyrian land. It is therefore the psalmist prays a complete restoration. He's calling for a complete restoration. He's just not calling for uh, a small group of people to be restored. But he's calling for a complete restoration. And hence when you read Psalm chapter 83, Psalm chapter 80, Psalm chapter 80, 80 verse 3, 80 verse 7, 80 verse 19, Jeremiah, all these, this is a cry for God's people to turn, for God to turn his people, to turn his people. So as we live in the day of atonement, when Jesus Christ is doing his final work in the most holy place, God, what is the cry of Jesus as our intercessor? Just like this psalmist was interceding for his people, but what is the cry of the intercessor in the most holy place? What is he crying for? He's crying for almost the same thing, a complete restoration of his people. Because of what the work of Jesus Christ on, cross, on the cross of Calvary has achieved for us. So he's crying for a complete restoration of his people. I read for you from the Spirit of Prophecy, uh, Great Controversy, page 485. Listen to the cry of your divine intercessor. As he stands before God, what is his cry? That right one righteous man, the one that sits high, the one that doesn't look down on anybody else. What does he cry for? Listen to what he says. He says, the divine intercessor presents the plea 
that all, how many? All who have overcome through what? Faith in his blood, the atoning work of Jesus, be forgiven their transgressions. His crime for all who by faith are holding on to the eternal sacrifice that he has made for them, that expensive errand for a soul. What is Jesus pleading for? Listen to what it says. The divine intercessor pleads that all who have overcome through faith, not in their own strength, but faith, the faith of Jesus in his blood, be forgiven their transgression, that they be restored to to their Eden home. That's the plea of Jesus. That we are restored to our Eden home and be crowned as joint heirs with him. The first dominion being given in Malachi chapter 4. This is what Jesus is crying for. See, Satan, in his effort to deceive and tempt our race, has thought to frustrate the divine plan in man's creation. But Jesus now, when? Now, during the Day of Atonement, when Jesus Christ is in the most holy place, now Jesus asked that this plan of salvation be carried out into effect as if man had never fallen. I don't know whether you understand that. The huge chunk of Jesus pleading for us, he's pleading with the Father, he says, now I want the divine plan to be carried out. Based on what, Jesus? What's your claim because of my eternal sacrifice for these people? I want this plan to be carried out into effect as if man had never fallen. He asked for his people not only to be pardoned and justification, full and complete, but a share in his glory and a seat upon his throne. That's the salvation. That's how huge the salvation of God is. Jesus is pleading for that for his people. A share, not only justification, pardon, full and complete, but he's also pleading for his people to be restored, to share in his glory. Remember, there's a verse that says, I share not my glory. But God's people will share in his glory based on what? Because they deserve that? No. God's people know themselves to be undeserving of anything. Of the favor of God, the mercy of God, anything else. They know themselves to be wretched, miserable. They have afflicted their souls. But it's based upon the work of Jesus. That double blessing. The work of Jesus. So let's go back to the book of Psalms, chapter 85, verse 5. It says, thou be... He's asking a question. Now this is the boldness. Listen to the boldness. Listen to the boldness of the intercessor. Because he understands, this psalmist who is writing these psalms understands the work of interceding for the people. And he's basically taking the role of our intercessor in heaven. You need to mirror this reality to what's happening in heaven right now for his people. Listen to what he says in Psalm chapter 85, verse 5. This is a question. He says, will thou be angry forever? Will thou be angry with us forever? Will thou draw out thine anger to all generation? This is a rhetorical question. God, are you going to be angry forever? See how this summons makes a bold plea. God has got every right to be angry and destructive. His anger to be upon us, to strike us down. Every right, every human being, righteous or not, in the streets, in the church, or whatever you call yourself, God has got every right to strike us down. But here is an intercessor, bold. Listen to what he says. Lord, are you going to be angry forever with us? Is your anger going to stretch out to all generations? He's pleading with the forever God. We are creatures of time. Creatures of time. So he's saying, God, are you going to be angry forever based on your quality as forever? We creatures of time? Will you not understand that we are nothing but dust? 
with the flowers that fed, the vapor that is there today and tomorrow, it's not, it's there in the morning and it's not. God, are you really going to be angry with such a group of people? Based on your divine quality as if we live in eternity, God, are you really going to be that God? Surely, Lord, are you, are, you have to be merciful to creatures of time, creatures of dust. Is your compassion going to be that less with us who are creatures of time? What is your life? James asked a question. What is your life? <laughs> what is your life? It is nothing but a vapor. <laughs> These are, is appealing to the, is asking. There is a boundary to the indignation of God towards the creatures of time. Ask, Lord, we, your favored people, we who are of your seed of Abraham, who understand that we are nothing. Your friend Abraham is pleading based on the covenant, the promissory covenant. He's not pleading based on the, on the covenants that we personally make with God, but he's pleading on the eternal covenant that he made with Abraham. Us, Lord, who are your friends, are you going to be angry with us forever? Let's go to verse 6. Listen to what it says. Will thou not revive us again? There's a work that God needs to do. Will thou not revive us again that thy people may rejoice? God wants us to be happy based on the work that he has done. He doesn't want us to live as if we live in a mournful uh, procession as his people. There's a certain rejoicing that comes as a result of the reviving work of God. Only God can revive. Only God can bring that back the dead. Only he that has life in him, original, unborrowed, Yahweh himself, can actually do the reviving work. We can't do it. Quit thinking it's you who can do this. Because in Psalms, listen to what it says in Psalms. In Psalms chapter 138, verse 7, it says, Psalm chapter, chapter 138, verse 7 and 8, it says, Though I walk in the midst of trouble, thou will revive me. Do I walk in the shadows of death? Thy road and thy staff do of what comfort me. It says, Thou shalt stretch out thine arm against the wrath of my enemies. Thine right hand shall save me. <laughs> he is going to do something that I cannot do. I cannot save myself from the wrath of my enemies, from the accusation of the enemy. I can't do that. Hence, my posture before God is standing there in my filthy garments and saying nothing, not a thing. And I'm standing there before God. I deserve everything. To be struck by you, your holiness, and to be accused by the enemy, I deserve all that. But I am not going to utter a word. In my filthiness, I am not going to utter a word. I will wait for the intercessor to plead my cause. And he pleads in the book of, 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 of Zechariah, he pleads, Zechariah chapter 3, he pleads. He says, is this not the brand that was plucked out of the fire? The fires of hells were kindling upon this brand and I stretched out my arm. You see, it says, listen to what it says in the book of Psalms, Psalm chapter, chapter, chapter 138 verse 7. It says, thou shalt stretch forth thine arm against the wrath of my enemy. Because in the book of, in the book of uh, uh, is, uh, Zechariah chapter 3, were presented as Joshua standing and is in filthy cloth. And then at his right arm, at, at standing beside him is the accuser. Accusing him of his own character. That's the filthy rags, our character, which are tainted with sin. Everything we do is tainted with selfishness and sin. It's leprosy. He says, for my iniquity, listen to what it says in verse 8. It says, the Lord will perfect that which concerns me. He's the one who's going to do. The Lord himself, the self-existent one. Thy mercy, O Lord, endure there forever. It endures forever. It says, forsake not the work of thy own hands. I am a work 
of God. <laughs> Forsake it not. The work of your own hands. God is doing something at the meal. He is the porter and making something. We might not understand what he's making, but can we trust that he's the porter with the clay and making something? Perfect mercy towards a perfect sinner. <laughs> Unless we see ourselves as perfect sinners, we will not appreciate the perfect work of Jesus. In Ezra chapter 9, verse 6 and 7, listen to what the Bible says, 6 through 7 to 9. He says, Ezra chapter 9, he says, And say, O oh my God, I am ashamed and I blush to lift up my face to thee. My God, for my iniquity increase over my head, and my transgression is gone up into the heavens. I'm guilty before heaven. He says, since the days of our fathers, we have been uh, in great transgression against this, against, we've been in a great transgression unto this day. Ezra is interceding. He says, since the days of our fathers, we have been in great transgression. Our fathers go back to our first Adam father. Since that, we've been in great transgression. He says, for our iniquities, for our iniquities have we, our kings, our princesses, have been, have been delivered into the hands of the kings of the land, says to the sword, to captivity, and to spoil, and to confusion of faces, as it is this day. In verse, nine, in verse 8, it says, And now, for a little space, a little space, grace has been shown from the Lord our God. To leave a remnant to escape, and to give unto us a nail in his holy place. The remnant will need a nail to hang on in his holy place. That our God may lighten our eyes and give us a little reviving in our bondage. Verse 9, it says, For we were bonds men yet our god has not forsaken us in our bondage but he has extended mercy unto us in the sight of the king of persia mercy in the sight of the king of persia persia is paradise in the sight of the king of paradise of heaven god has extended mercy. Mercy is for sinners. To give, listen to what it says, to give us a reviving. The giving of reviving is a gift. To set upon the house of our God and to repair the desolations thereof and to give us a war in Jerusalem and in Judea. So it says, listen, in verse 8, it reminded us that there's a remnant that escapes and to give us a nail in his holy place. That nail is an assure abode. The nail itself, it's a picture of the nail in the most holy place. The picture of the nails that pierce the hands of Jesus. That's where we hang our souls. The nail in the most holy place right now. Calvary has been immortalized into the most holy place. In, in, in Isaiah chapter 22, 22 through to 24, listen to what it says. And the key of the house of David shall be laid upon his shoulder. He shall open and none shall shut. And he shall shut and none shall open. This is the key. Aren't you glad that heaven's path does not pass anyone else's backyard? The key to the house of David shall be laid upon his shoulder. And he shall open and none shall shut. He shall shut and none shall open. Verse 23 it says, And I will fasten upon him as a nail in a sure place. <laughs> and he shall be for a glorious throne to his father's house. 
Verse 24, and they shall hang upon him. Come on now. The verse tells us, we shall hang upon him all the glory of his father's house. All the glory. Heaven's glory. All the glory. Glory and honor, exalted, marvelous, and praise belongs unto God. Read Revelation chapter 15. All the glory, the redeemed heap everything on Christ. The offsprings and the issue and all the vessels of small qualities and all the vessels of cups and ev even to all the vessels of the fragrance, everything, the vessels of our sanctification and everything else is heaped upon one person. That is Jesus, the God of our salvation. Isaiah 57, verse 14, listen to what it says. This is the gospel. This is the good news. This is what brings people to God. This is what melts the hearts of men. It says, and shall say, cast ye up, cast ye up, prepare the way, prepare the way, and take up, take up the stumbling block out of the way of the people. Cast ye up, prepare the way, lift up, mount up the stumbling block. We stumbled upon the one stumbling block, and that's Jesus. The rock of offense is Jesus. That's the rock of offense in the church. We stumble upon Jesus. It has been the rock of offense from, from, from the ages, from the times of the apostles, in the time of Jesus. The rock of offense. Check out the stumbling block that God has laid. That chief cornerstone that has been rejected by the builders. It is Jesus. But lift it up. Remember Jesus says, if I be lifted up, I will do what? Draw all men unto me. Isaiah 57 verse 15, it says, For that saith the high and the lofty one. <laughs> There's only why one who is high and lofty one, that inhabiteth eternity, who his name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place. And with me is that of the contrite and humble spirit. The contrite and humble spirit, it says, they will dwell with me. What a God. It says to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite one. The one who's been broken by God. God says, I'll revive. Verse 7 Let's go back now to our psalm in verse 7, the focus of our study. Psalm chapter 85, verse 7. It says, Show us thy mercy, O God, and grant us thy salvation. We need to be shown something that we cannot see. Remember, we are in the Laodicean age. The Laodicean church, Revelation chapter uh, 3, tells us of the Laodicean church. Which God says you are increased with goods and think you are in need of nothing. This is your reasoning. But you don't know that you're blind, you're miserable. We are blind, we can't see. So we need to see thy mercy, the mercy of God. Oh God, and grant us. Give us a grant. <laughs> we got no money. Grant us. Show us thy mercy and grant us. What God causes us to turn, when God causes us to turn, we shall see the mercies of God. In Jeremiah, listen to what it says upon this idea in Jeremiah. Jeremiah 42, verse 12, it says, And I will show mercies unto you, that ye may have mercy upon, that he may have mercy upon you, and cause you to return to my land. Mercy causes retention. God says, I'm going to show you my mercy. It is the goodness of God that causes us to repent. When we see the goodness of God, the good work of God, when we see the mercies of God, that is the one that causes us to return. Listen now, uh, let's read uh, verse 8. It says in Psalms chapter 85, verse 8, it says, And I will show, and I will hear. This is the hope of the intercessor. After he's intercessed and says, God, show us your mercy and all this. It comes to verse 8, it says, And I will hear what the Lord, the God, will speak. Everyone needs to shut up. 
Let every man be a liar and God be true. Everyone shut the hell up. We talk too much. God says, everyone else shut up. The psalmist says, I will hear what the Lord speaks. We need to shut our narrative and just hear what God has to say. Everyone else, shut the hell up. Let every man be a liar and let God be true. That every mouth might be stopped. And hear God. For he will speak. What is he going to say? He will speak peace unto his people. Shalom, Solomon. Rest upon his people. Unto his sense. But let them not turn again to folly. So God is going to do what? He's going to speak peace upon his people. His people. If he speaks peace to, 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 to people that are not part of his sense, he will surely speak people to his sense that have gone wayward. He says, let them not again turn. If sinners can be led to give, listen to what is this? This is a quotation. I'm going to read to you a quotation now. In Faith That I Live By, page 103, paragraph 2. The spirit of prophecy tells us this. Peace, this peace that God is going to speak upon his people. It says, if, if sinners can be led to give one earnest look at the cross, if they can obtain a full view of the crucified Savior, they will realize the depth of God's compassion. The problem is that within compassion... <laughs> God help us. God help me. Let me read to you again this. If sinners can be given one earnest look at the cross, if they can obtain a full view of the crucified Savior, they will realize the depth of God's compassion and the sinfulness of sin. They see the depth of God's compassion. And then they see the sinfulness of sin. Continuing, it says, it says, has your conscience been awakened by the Holy Spirit? You will see something of the evil of sin, of its power, of its beauty, of its war. And you will look upon it in abhorrence. You long to be forgiven, to be cleansed, and to be set free. Harmony with God. Likeness to him. What can you do to obtain it? The quotation continues, it says, it is peace that you need. It is what? Peace that you need. Heaven's forgiveness and peace. Love in the soul. Love in the soul. What do people need? The peace of heaven. Love in the soul. It says money cannot buy it. Intellect cannot procure it. Wisdom cannot attain it. You can never hope it. By your own efforts to secure it. But God offers it to you as a gift. Without money, he says, and without price, come. Isaiah 53, this one. It says, without money and without price, come. I'm offering it to you as a gift. As a gift. Another quotation from the Spirit of Prophecy. First Selected Messages, page 393, paragraph, paragraph 3, it says, 394, it says, The Lord would have his people sound in faith. Listen to me. Let no man take away your armor of faith. You lose the armor of faith, you're gone into despair. You shrink into darkness. He says, the Lord would have his people sound in faith, not ignorant of the great salvation so abundantly provided for them. There's a great salvation that has been so abundantly provided for them. They are not to look forward, thinking that at some future time, a great work will be done for them. For the work is now complete. 
The believer is not called upon to make peace with God. He can never and has he can never and has no ever can do this. Oh, make peace with God. Oh, do this with God. You can never do that. You've not been called upon to do that as a believer. He is to accept Christ as his peace. For with Christ is God and peace. Christ has made an end of sin, bearing its heavy case upon his own body on a tree. And he has taken away the case from all those who believe in him as their personal savior. He makes an end of the controlling power of sin in the heart. And the life and the character of the believer testifies of the genuine character of the grace of Jesus. To those who, to those that ask him, Christ imparts the Holy Spirit. For it is necessary that the believer should be delivered from the pollution as well as from the curse and the condemnation of the law. Through the work of the Holy Spirit, the sanctification of the truth, the believer becomes fitted for the courts of heaven. We are in the business of being fitted for the courts of heaven by the work of the Holy Spirit. Fitness, going to the gym, gymnastics. Spiritual gymnastics, I mean. For Christ works within us and his righteousness is upon us. Within us, God does a work and his righteousness is upon us, covers us. In the book of Acts, as I'm ending the study for today, in the book of Acts chapter 10, there's 39, 38, so 36, sorry. It says, the word which God has sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. Preaching what? Peace. Come, I've reconciled myself unto you. Peace makes us to stop fighting God. All confidence in the flesh is destroyed by peace. We do not return to our folly because we are at peace with God. Verse 8, folly. That word folly in verse 8, in some chapter. 85, verse 8, it says, let them not return again unto their folly. That word folly, in a good sense, it means trust, silliness, confidence in your own flesh. This human potential confidence that we have in ourselves. Listen to what Psalms, uh, the rest of the verses say as we end our study. It says, surely his salvation is nigh unto them that fear him. That glory may dwell in the land. We want his glory to dwell in the land. It says, mercy and truth have met each other. And peace, righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Truth shall spring from the earth. And righteousness shall look down from heaven. When God looks down from heaven, after all this has been done, what does he see? He sees a canopy of peace. He sees a foundation of truth. He sees peace upon his people. Yea, the Lord shall has given that which is good, and our land shall yield its increase. He sees the greenness happening, this freshy life of his own righteousness. Listen to what he says in the last verse. He says, righteousness shall go forth from before him and set us in the ways of his steps, the forerunner. The steps into the most holy place. God calls on us to do a work. God calls us to do a work and to trust him and to give all glory to him. This is the God of our salvation. This is the salvation that is purchased for us. God bless you.